Okay. So this is lecture 22 of ECE 5312. Okay. And this lecture is really defined the sort of channel, channel, something else. Okay. And so. I'm, you know, we can look at the slide material, but I rather we we do what I love doing best, which is doodling. Okay, so let's actually go over to the computer. Okay, so so far what we've seen is something along these lines. We have a transmitter. Okay, it goes through a channel, right? That essentially introduces noise. So that's my S of T. Let's say it's an I. And then it's received. The signal is intercepted. And this guy here is my channel. So what does this signal look like? Well, essentially, R of T, like, so let's say, very simply, let's say I have something that looks like this. And then the noise guy here, so that's S I of T. The noise would look like and then the receive signal, the receive signal would look something like, right, over a period T. So what we've looked at so far is we looked at ways of conveying information. of electricity over every period T transmitted through a medium that will introduce some sort of not nice thing, in this case noise, right? And then our receiver is like, okay, I intercepted something, what am I, right? And it's, and it's a really kind of like we, we try to build the best receiver possible given that we understand that our signal has what we've looked at so far in the previous lectures up until now. now. You might wonder, how do we do this thing? What, like, you know, so we looked at, we've looked at models where the typical block diagram for the communication system. We might have a source encoder. Then we'll have some Uh, you know, that's our uh, S of T, and then that goes to some sort of RF front end, and goes, oh, okay, so, so we take this all for granted, right? All of this is just like every box, we assume, okay, that's binary, that's binary, that's binary, oh, and this thing is our waveform, our information that's occurring at this point here and it will produce some sort of way. There's basically a mapping of binary ones and zeros that have been source encoded, channel encoded, and boom, I give you a waveform, right? This one, this one, this one, this one. And if it's like M equals 256, there are 250 waveforms. Now, oh yeah, now let's look at this from a different perspective. I don't want this. <laughs> okay, what we want to do, let's look at this from a different perspective. Information source. And this guy produces information bits or symbols or whatever, samples. What happens is it goes into an impulse modulator. So what does the impulse modulator do? We, we take a zoom. So what does this guy do? Nope, I want to do that. What this guy does 
is essentially it just produces, like, you know, let's say you have a 555 timer or something that just produces a string, an infinite number of impulses that are all regularly spaced, right? That is t seconds apart, and they're all unit height. T, 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 T. Now, what happens is, let's say this impulse modulator takes the impulse train, choo choo, impulse train, and then what it does is it multiplies every T second, what that impulse is, with n. So, what do you get at the end? This guy multiplied by, let's say, this is dot, 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 let's say, i, uh, n minus 3, i, n minus 2, i, n minus 1, i, n, i, n plus 1, i, n plus 2, dot, dot, dot. So what I'm essentially doing is I'm taking all those deltas and I'm adjusting their amplitudes. So this is... This is the next step. And you might say, okay, so why is Wuglinski going this cockamamie approach for doing this? Because if you look at an actual software-defined radio, oh, if you look at an actual software-defined radio, like, you know, we, we take for granted, oh, this thing will... It doesn't quite do that. Digital, digital. You're eating shoving samples into it and it creates analog waveforms that get upconverted to RF frequencies or the other way down. It's all samples, right? So in this case, I then take this impulse modulator okay <sighs> okay and what happens is the output here, I should use another color. My apologies. What this is going to look like is essentially it's going to be the summation of IN and then it will be delta T minus NT. And then N is from minus infinity to infinity. So what do I have? I have a string, an infinite string of deltas. Reality, we're not transmitting forever, right? Unless you're like some teenager texting, in which case you are transmitting forever. Oh, no, LOL. Now, what happens is this looks like, like this. So let's say one amplitude's this, another one's this, another one's this, another one's this. Maybe another one's bigger. Maybe another one's even bigger. Oh, now we're back to that. Dot, 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 dot. Now, here's the final third ingredient is, like, we hear it a lot, but let's say you have some sort of filter here before you transmit, before you create that symbol, that waveform, that, let's say, S of T, and you have some sort of pulse shaping filter, some sort of, maybe, let's say, more generically, you have a transmit filter, and it's some sort of FIR, Impulse response. Oh, it's some sort of let's say let's say it has something that looks like this, right? So what happens? What happens when you feed a delta into some sort of system? Like with an impulse response, you flush out its impulse response, right? The impulse response is the response of the system. It's the output response of a system to feeding in an impulse. Now, if this is LTI, and I feed a co collection of amplitudes into an LTI system with a specific impulse response, what do you get out? You get the combination of all those impulse responses, all adjusted in terms of amplitude by what IN is like, spaced out by T. What do you mean by that? Let's look at this. You have to admit technology is great. Okay, so what do I mean by that? So let's say I feed in the following. Keep things simple. 
Let's say I have, let's say I have two amplitudes, either plus one or minus one. Someone's phone's ringing. <laughs> I really need to get a new ringtone. Now, I feed this into my transmit filter. Right? And suppose it's something nice and band limited. So let's say it looks like that. Let, let's say I'm just like really scared to do anything too crazy. So let's say it's a rectangular pulse, amplitude 1. What is the output going to look like? Amplitude's going to look like this. Right? So this is, let's say that's 0, that's t, that's 2t, that's 3t, that's 4t, that's 5t. So that's 0, t, 2t, 3t, 4t, that's 5t. So what I've done is I've created my analog waveform. And, you know, in reality, what it's going to be is it's going to be a slew of discrete samples because you're going to have some sort of interpolation rate, right? So what happens is, let's say your transmit filter, your transmit filter upsamples by a certain integer factor, right? And it'll flush out sort of a discrete time representation of that waveform. You pass it through a digital to analog converter. What it will do? It'll smooth it out. It'll make an analog waveform based on what you feed in, right? And that gets upconverted to RF frequencies, right? So this model is kind of interesting. We have our information bits, or information samples, information symbols. We multiply it against every t against a delta, and then we flush out a waveform from the impulse response. That's cool, huh? So far, so good? Everyone with me? Or everyone's like, I don't like signals and systems. No! I love signals and systems. What happens is this is really important. Why is this important? Because the next thing I'm going to show you is going to knock your socks off, right? The next thing I'm going to show you is what happens if I don't have something tidy and nice and well confined? Suppose that is not, that symbol, that waveform is not well contained in 0 to t. What happens if it spills out? folks, is what I'm worried about. And, and it's not only, and you might say, well, why not design a better transmit filter, professor? Well, that's one part of the puzzle. Let's, 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 let's first of all, let me show you end to end what you have to worry about. Ah, no, no, no. So this is what I'm, what I'm talking about. So here's your info source. That's your impulse train modulator, so your impulse modulator, imp mod. This is your TX filter. And so this here, let's say we keep everything in the baseband. This is your transmitter. Now, you might say, oh, that should be the next thing that should be added. Oh, no, no, no. What happens is we've got a channel filter. And then we add the noise. And so what this guy does, this guy models the non-ideal effects of all, OK, so depending on which community you're in, like the easiest way to describe it is echo, right? So echo, so Grand Canyon. You know, especially cool when you do it from the bottom of the Grand Canyon. So it's like the hike six hours, go to it's probably over 120 degrees. Hello, hello. And Professor McGillicy's right. Too bad I can't make it back up. You know, so. <laughs> what happens is in the auto, audio community, they call, don't call it echo. They call it reverberation. Such a cool name, huh? Reverberation. In our community, in wireless and stuff, we call it multipath. Right? 
we take our wireless signal, boop, 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 and it's bouncing all over the place. And then it constructively or destructively, or both, combines at the point of reception, right? So what happens is this channel, it's interesting. You can model that reverberation, and it makes sense, as I'll describe in a second. The channel model for this echoes, or reverberation, or multipath, is actually, you can model it as an FIR filter. Then, oh yeah, then we feed this into the receive filter, and then we do all this sort of demod stuff, right? So, demod. Now, so I promised you guys one thing, which is that channel filter. How do you model that? Well, so what happens is, you can do this in MATLAB. So I'm not going to assign this as a homework problem or anything, but what I would recommend you do, if you don't have a copy of MATLAB, get one, maybe get a student one. Upload your voice. So say, Professor Wiglinski is weird. Okay, so record that or something. Oh, yeah, and then put on YouTube and send me a link and I'll have a good laugh and my wife will say, what are you laughing at? What happens is, in MATLAB, take your speech, the speech recorded signal, and then pass it through like an FIR filter with multiple taps, multiple delays, with different amplitude values, and what do you get? If you space them out enough, you'll get that echo. You'll basically get copies of my speech, and normally what you is your that you have something like that, you have something like this. And so what it's going to be is something like this. Hello, 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 hello. Of course, if let's say these paths are closer together, then things get kind of interesting. So let's suppose I have something like this then this gets kind of messy, right? Then it's like, hello, you know, and it becomes almost unintelligible, right? And that is seriously bad stuff, especially if it's a wireless communication problem. So we can, because it's nothing more than a collection of delayed copies of the same signal, how do you make the received signal experience multipath or reverberation? You pass through an FIR filter. Now, some cases might have this weird scenario. Uh, like, there's an indoor channel. So this is a journal paper from... So I might say, okay, what, what the heck is going on, Professor? Okay, so what I figured is that, first of all, you're going to have clusters of reflections. So when a wireless signal hits a wall, it doesn't hit it exactly, and you get exactly one copy of that signal hitting the receive antenna. No, there's localized scatter around the point of impact. There's localized scatter around the... There's localized scatter around the receiver. So what you have is this mess. Every reflection will actually be a collection of different reflections coming in at different times with different strengths. Sometimes there's also phase rotations of some unknown amount, especially if you hit, let's say, drywall versus window versus metal or, yeah, behind this. How many people think there's metal behind this? There's actually, if you there's a metal surface right behind us. So, wow, we got stone followed by metal. How will that affect the energy? So, you have this very different, diverse environment. And so, each one of these clusters represents one of those major impacts with a surface before your receive antenna picks it up. And then, these little delay elements here rep 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 represents 
the individual reflections off of, let's say, that single surface of that, that single ray, and they come in approximately at the same time, but with some delay. Sometimes they combine constructively, and sometimes they combine destructively. That's why you have also the variable amplitude, but they should follow an exponential decay per cluster. Now, you're going to have different clusters coming in, because let's say there's this one bunch of energy coming off of that wall. Oh, but there's also the ceiling, and there's a floor, and there's all these other areas. So they, what they did is they modeled all these clusters, and what happens is the amplitude is dictated by the first ray in each cluster as a really random variable, and then what happens is you have the exponential decay per cluster. Then you have an exponential decay across all the clusters, and then you also have inter, um, inter cluster arrival time and intra cluster arrival time. So you have all these very interesting aspects. The intra and inter are all Poisson arrival processes based on an exponential random process. So they model all this and then they proved it using experimental results. Ah, so lane balance way long. So this is kind of like here is kind of like the extreme case of a channel model. But that's what we're worried about. So what is our goal? So why do we have to transmit and receive filters? Because think of it, our signal, we would love it that the D mod only has to deal with the impulse mod output. And then we can extract IN from it, right? So what's our goal? Our goal is that the cascade of transmit filter, channel filter, and receive filter when results in no distortion whatsoever, other than noise. So that we're going to see in lecture 23 to design the first, our first attempt at designing transmit filters and receive filters such that in the end, we have zero ISI. Because if we don't, this is what happens. As you can see, I really missed this thing, so I'm spending a lot of time on it. But so what we'll see in the slides, suppose that we have a response, overall response, that looks like this, like a whale, right? So let's say. This is supposed to be a square wave. So let's say, ideally, we should have had something that looked like this. But fat chance, right? Actually, I should draw that way better. I'm sorry. So what happens is, what we in fact get is something that looks like that. So we have a rise time. Oh my god, we're going back to circuit analysis. We have a rise time, we have steady state, and boom, we have the decay back to zero. Now, imagine this guy. So suppose we represent him as a filter H of T, and then we've trained now these impulse responses to go into the system that's described by H of T. What happens? What you'll get is the following. I'm going to try really hard on this, but no, no, no promises, okay? 0, t, 2t, 3t, 4t. So what we basically have, I'm going to use a different color, is the first guy is going to be this impulse response and it's going to go like that. The second guy The third guy looks like him. And the fourth guy, oh, he actually doesn't decay. My bad. Just continues on, right? So this is what we're worried about. Because at the receiver, what am I going to be looking for? I'm going to be sampling. My, my D mod is going to be T seconds, boom, what is it? Boom, what is it? It should be either plus or minus one. What we actually get, so let's say here it's zero, right? 
We sample, okay, that's plus one. This guy, uh-oh, is not minus one because we also have a positive term from the tail end of the previous symbol. So it's actually minus one plus some positive stuff from the previous symbol. Oh, now, look, look at this guy. Plus one, plus this guy, minus that guy. Next guy, plus, and it's, it's still going to be plus, right? Minus, but it's going to be very small, and then a little bit of contribution from the plus. So, graphically, what happens is, although we would love to have waveforms that abruptly turn on and turn off, we don't actually have that. And then, and, and how do we get a situation? Even if we have a transmit filter that does that, our channel might introduce distortion that would, I like to use this term because I think graphically, everyone can have a mental picture, smears our signal. So it might be nice to and then because of the channel, it smears out the information, that reverberation. That so this is what I'm worried about. At every sampling instance, so I say T, 2T, 3T, 4T, ideally, I just want my symbol and nothing else. In reality, I get that symbol and all the previous guys before, but small amounts, introducing themselves. And you might say, what? How does this impact the probability of error? Everything. It really does impact everything. OK. What I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to the slides because I think everyone's like, when is he going to stop using that whiteboard thing? I'm sorry, it's been two weeks. I'm like missing that thing. I was like, hey, Jen, can I go, can I go to WPI? I want to play with my whiteboard. And she's like, no. OK. So we saw this, right? Transmitter model. We got transmit filter. G so the, the nomenclature is usually G, at least in this course. G, for this segment of this course, is our transmit filter. OK? So what happens is we saw this. The output of our transmitter is going to be a train of these transmit filter impulse responses that either have a positive or a negative amplitude based on what i n is equal to, right? Because as we saw, remember, what did we represent our impulse train? The summation from minus infinity to infinity, i of n, delta t minus n of t, right? Every period, we get a delta. And then the i influences what its amplitude is. And then we feed it into, an imp into a filter with an impulse response. G of t, what should the output be? A train. Amplitude is the train. And delayed by n of t. Some now, this is the new thing, C of f. So we usually, some people use h of t channel. Some people use c of t. There's another name for it. It's called channel impulse response, or CIR, sir. <laughs> so when you have this, and then, like what I mentioned before, we need to decode this sucker. We're going to have a receive filter, w of f, or w of t. And we sample, 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 sample. So there are several huge assumptions being made here. Synchronization. Did anyone see that? Right? So I'm assuming that I'm sampling at the right instances. Like, so from 4305, offer to find radio class. What was the hardest thing? Figuring out where to sample. No one's telling you that at a receiver, right? So we're making, we don't have to worry about that. We're not doing synchronization in this course. Thank goodness. What happens is, assume that we are sampling spot on. But even when we're sampling perfectly, we still have this stuff we don't want. The okay. So what happens is, the quantizer, essentially, is it a positive value? Yes, plus one. Is it a negative value? Yes, minus one. Right? All I'm doing is, is it positive or negative? And that's all I'm looking for. So where, before we looked at band-limited channels, when we had AWGN, what is our biggest fear? When the amount of noise introduced, we have this freak incident, and the noise basically makes a positive value go negative. 
live. And then we decode it incorrectly. That's our probability of error, right? Now, did you see I did that example? When you have ISI, let, let's say you have a positive signal, but you had, let's say, a bunch of preceding negative symbols, and they eat away at that. We had the positive value at sampling instant NT. Oh, but you also have negative, 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 negative. Plus noise. Imagine noise was negative. Now you're losing to the decision. Right? Oh, I'm totally going to go back to the computer for this one. Okay. So remember what we did before. Oh, okay. So I have this, and so let's say afterwards um, I have this. Okay. And and suppose what happens is so that's t. That's zero. Ah, sorry. And that's two t. And so what happens is let's say I'm sampling here. So what is it? So this guy is going to be minus one. But there's this pesky thing here. So there's, then we add some sort of term, right? So this positive value, let's just call it A. Oh, and then on top of that, I have some sort of noise, right? So let's say the noise is positive. Let's say this guy is obviously positive. Let's say our decision threshold essentially is a quantizer that says anything Below this line, that's our threshold, anything below is classified as a 0, and anything above is classified as a 1. So let's say I transmitted a 0, which is a minus 1 amplitude, positive ISI terms, intersymbol interference terms, from previous symbols, plus and for example, if you add this guy along with this positive value plus let's say there was a fluke there was some positive noise i'm now incorrectly deciding doing is it's moving moving let's say symbols closer of the decision region thresholds right right Okay, so if we go back, so let's, let's look at the ISI model. So first of all, if you have the, what I rep wrote here, okay, so you have the cascade, so, so let, let's say if we have, let's say our V, that's our transmitted signal, our transmitted signal is convolved with the channel impulse response, T. So it's being distorted, and then we add noise, okay? And so what we might want to do is, let's say uh, we can rewrite this thing here, okay? So if we rewrite it, so what happens is we have the convolution of the impulse, transmit impulse response with the, with the um, uh, what is it called? Uh, channel impulse response, and you might say, okay, how, where did that come from? Well, the answer is we have like either plus one or minus one, but that, that is just sort of the information, um, information signal. What we really care about here is sort of like the receive one, W of T, that's added in series. What happens is Right now, what we're looking at, this H of T, is really the concatenation of transfer filter and channel impulse response. So it's an FIR filter. And so what, we're, what we want to do is we want to now take that, and we're going to use this terminology H. So whenever we use H in this lecture, I don't mean just channel impulse response. It is the concatenation of channel impulse response and transmit filter. All right, for now. And then we're going to look at the receive filter. My information, 
that's being sent over the air or over a copper wire or with a fiber optic cable and some sort of being band limited. There's distortion more than just noise, right? So, and this is what I mean. So let's say we take that ideal rectangular pulse and then I have this sucker. So I intentionally chose, if you notice, a, a raise, uh, sorry, a, a resistor capacitor, RC, a low pass filter type of model. So this is beautiful. So I, I forgot, who was it? Yeah, even at today's office hours, I was talking about like when I took the, the undergraduate equivalent of signals and, si not signals and systems, circuit analysis at uh, when I was doing my undergrad. And, and, and I had this memory of learning this exact thing in a class full of 230 people in this dark, dingy, subterranean auditorium. Like we were literally underneath like a, like a, a road or something like that. And it was dark and I could barely hear the instructor. And it was about transient responses, right? So what happens when you have a capacitor resistor circuit? So the capacitor is either being charged up when there's actually some, some like, you know, some energy being flowed across it, and then when it's discharging, well, you're discharging, like when, when you don't have any, like let's say when you, well, okay, I'm too much hand, hand waving. That's why I've got this really cool toy. So everyone remembers how these things work? I hope. So what happens is when you transmit or you turn on, what happens? So you have a potential across the terminals, right? So current's flowing, and during the transient response, you're building up a charge over here, correct? Then when you turn off, and this guy's not doing anything, your capacitor is now discharging. It's almost appearing like it's your circuit's still on, but it's not discharging at the same rate at which you had the original potential, right? So the way this would work is when you turn it on, in, when you observe from here, right, what the potential is at these terminals, you're not going to see everything because some of that energy is being fed into the capacitor. And, and once a capacitor saturates or reaches steady state, that's when you plateau and you get the expected uh, output potential at the output here. And then when you turn it off, this guy now discharges into the output direction. So that's why you get that transient response. So th everyone should have seen this, right? Okay? Okay. Yeah, I remember seeing that and it brings back memories. <laughs> so. Suppose we have this scenario. Suppose we have a band-limited channel that looked like an RC circuit. Okay? What happens is, suppose we have this, and this is totally legit. This could be a perfectly legit channel that we're dealing with. What happens? The following. So we get that, that sort of like, like, like a transient response, and then we hit steady state. Oh, it turned off transient response back to steady state zero. Now, just like what I drew before, because let's su suppose my drawing skills on the whiteboard is not so great, I, I drew, for, you, for your benefit, I drew this also on the slides. This is ISI in action. But, but it's not the complete story, because this is all, there's a name for it, let me see if I get it right, this is all post-cursor ISI. So this is ISI caused by previously transmitted signals. There's also something called precursor ISI, which is the result of uh, signals that have yet to be fully transmitted. So they're influencing ahead of themselves of a desired sampling instant. We'll look at that in a few minutes. But this is totally a, a post-cursor ISI scenario. So let's say here's our first transmitted symbol. It starts at zero, chuka, 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 chuka. here's T, and then it turns off, but it doesn't completely turn off. It still continues to transmit. Now, the second pulse. And then, 
charges and keeps on going, right? So this is identical to this. The right? In my example, what happens is I just left the darn thing. But to be true to the implementation of the impulse train modulator, we have to superimpose all the individual impulses, impulse response that are produced at the output of H of T. Correct? Right? Now, this guy. And that, but negative amplitude and delayed by 2t. If we add this together, this But this for No, this guy this guy's okay too. So where's our decision threshold to decide whether a 1 or a minus 1 amplitude has been transmitted? It's the zero marker on the y-axis, right? Plus, like, you know, to the naked eye, all of us, all of us beings, right? Then we have to tell it to the computer or the radio. When we look at this, if it's a positive waveform, it's a plus. If we sample it at T, Sample at t, it's a negative value. It's minus one, right? Now, the first guy, we have good fortune with him. He's a positive amplitude. He has no previous, previous ISI. He should be cool. The second guy, we're still in good shape because what essentially happens is we have a positive value at 2t for the second pulse, and we have a positive value ISI from the first pulse, so it even makes it more positive. In fact, this is kind of desirable. This ISI is helping. We're moving away from the x-axis threshold that says, is it plus one or minus one, right? As we'll see, I'm trying to think which lecture. I think in the next lecture, in fact, some ISI results in even better error performance for that symbol, because what happens is you move further away so it takes even more noise in order to make it transfer over to the other side to create an error. Oh, but now this guy is kind of truncated. So let's say, so in this case, there's no ISI. This case, we have a positive ISI term with a positive amplitude. Even better, this is like the super duper case. This is great. We're moving further away from the decision boundary. The x-axis. Ah, but here's the bad thing. We have a different amplitude plus two positive ISI terms. We're bringing this guy closer to that decision threshold. That's bad news. How do we quantify that? We'll see. It's a Q function as well. Oh, yes. It's a Q function, and, we'll, and it actually weighs into that D-min calculation. Because what we're essentially doing is decreasing minimum So let's, let's look at this more carefully from one non-confusing diagram. And this is it. So what we've got, what we've got is um, at every sampling instant, a t, a 2t, a 3e, a 3t, what we're basically doing, if let's say we have i n being either plus, what we really care about is the amplitude of this waveform. All we're doing is we're picking off this is an H of T, right? So what we're doing is we're sampling H of T at, um, at, H, uh, at the, let's say, T equals to T, big T, and uh, 2T and 3T, right? So the, this guy here is H of big T. This is H of 2T. This is H of 3T, right? Same waveform. And then what happens is we, we have the I N. And these get, guys get concatenated together depending on what our ISI situation is. Yeah? So, the goal, okay, so there's several things. So first of all, I mentioned about perfect synchronization. So if we have some sort of sampling offset, we have a little T-naught, we have that. So let's say we want to sample at big T, big 2T, big 3T, all those. 
in reality, <laughs> depending on what type of software-defined radio you have, you might have a small offset T naught. Okay, so now you're sampling slightly off from where you want that impulse response to be. Suppose that T naught is equal to zero, so we're sampling spot on every sample. What we have is essentially at the end of the day. So what? Where am I getting this diagram from? So let's. I'm going to do a little bit of drawing because I'm long overdue. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh. As you can see, I'm having too much fun up here. You know, some professors, what they do in their class, sometimes as part of the course credit, they ask groups of students to come in. So I'm not, how many people would be game for that, to teach a lecture of this stuff? No. <laughs> Everyone's smiling like, <laughs> no, no way, Jose. Ah, <sighs> OK. So, so let's, let's take an example, OK? So suppose I have this guy here. So let's say that's uh, t, that's 2t, and that's 3t. So suppose 3t is this. Okay. Suppose 2t is this. And suppose 1t, just to keep things separate, is this. So the question is, at this instant, what do we have? So what happens is we have this guy here. So who's he? So let's say this guy, he's I3, right? So, he, so is, uh, should we start from zero? Yeah, so if we, yeah, we, I heard someone say 2. So let's, let's do that. So let's say we have I2. And suppose this guy here, so, so, let's, so let's doodle on the side here. So our basic H of T looks like this. So we have this guy at T. We have this guy at 2T. And then we have this guy at 3T, right? So what we have, okay, is essentially this I2, and then it's H at big T. That's his height. Now, what's the ISI contributions? Because everything gets added together. So we now have the previous guy. Let's see the previous symbol. He's I of 1, and he's H of 2T, right? Because essentially, this guy here, this waveform, He's not, we're not sampling at this point. We're sampling actually at this guy and multiplying it by whatever his height is. So that's I1. And then the last guy is this waveform here. And he's basically, he's not T. He's not 2T. He's 3T away. So that's plus I0, the first transmitted symbol, H of 3T. So this is the desired target term. And these guys here are my intersymbol interference, right? So mathematically, what we do, and in reality, what happens is the more symbols that we transmit all to every sampling, there will be a significant contribution, and there will not, and there's some that we can neglect. We can ignore after a few. Right? Because you notice how this thing decays. Right? Right? So, in our slide, that's exactly what I'm doing here. I can take the, and that's why I'm saying this type of distortion is deterministic. We know exactly what it's doing. We know exactly its amplitude. And what the, so that combined with the wild card, the randomness of the noise, now we're in trouble. Right? So, we represent this thing here. This is shorthand, okay? So what we have here is this is the ELTH transmitted symbol. And then H0 corresponds to this guy. Then we have the, the previous guy that occurred and this guy 
the guy that uh, transmitted before him, and this guy, and so on and so forth. And we call these, the, guy, the symbols that happened in the past, we call these guys the post-cursor ISI contributions. It is possible, and it's kind of like, how is this possible? What happens is, imagine if you have a non-causal pulse shape. What happens is, suppose you have a waveform that starts sometime in the future and ends sometimes in the past. So you have something that's not causal. Now what happens is, imagine a symbol that's not been completely transmitted yet influence your current symbol. We call this precursor ISI. So you might say, well, how does this happen in real life? Well, think about it. So wireless communication is a little tricky because everything has to be causal. Otherwise, we'll have like future, future predicting. And then you get the Nobel Prize. With me, of course. Oh, no. But what happens is, suppose it's like some sort of digital media, pre-recorded stuff, right? And you do processing there. Or some sort of environment where you can have non-causal type of um, LTI systems. Then this can possibly happen. But in reality, like we're going to be looking mostly at causal type of uh, systems. But just in case, just for completeness, it is possible to have, let's say, the future symbol and, let's say, the non-causal, the anti-causal part of your waveform. So let's say here it starts in zero and goes off to infinity. Let's say you have a waveform that starts from minus infinity and goes to plus infinity. And then you have a future symbol. It too can influence what your current sample is, theoretically. Right? This is an example where we're playing totally by the causal book. But we'll see there is a symbol that actually is non-causal, but we see it all the time in communications. And that symbol, oh yes, <gasps> sync pulses, right? What happens is, imagine a rectangular pulse, and normally what we do when we have a rectangular pulse, we usually have a zero and n, so we actually time shift it, right? But in reality, what we want to do is, and, what's, and so, um, well, that's in the frequency domain, right? But in the time domain, what are what, what's what's this, uh, what is a rectangular like? What's the inverse Fourier transform of a sync pulse? It will be I mean, of of a square wave. It's a sync pulse, and this waveform we're going to see several times, right? But this is what I mean by precursor and postcursor. These are the time domain samples of the impulse response h of t that have not occurred yet, or are in the process of occurring from some futuristic symbol that's being transmitted. Right? And it's influencing the now. This is, this is the desired instant we want to play with. Postcursor, this already has happened. Precursor, this has yet to happen. Okay? So what we do is we set up, let's say, if we try to decode, let's say, a specific symbol, we basically sum up the desired sampling instant plus all the precursor and postcursor as ISI and add the noise. Now, here's a notation. So this is a notational word. I can break it up into I naught, H naught. That's the desired sample and the desired impulse at, for that desired sample at time equals zero. And then I sum up all the precursor and postcursor ISI. Oh, there's a tick mark. What's that tick mark next to the summation? Exclude k equals zero. Okay. So that's some fun nomenclature. And then the noise. And so if you do that, your ISI model okay, will, will basically be expressed like so. So you have the precursor, postcursor. So this is our ISI model. We'll be using this in, in the next lecture in order to understand more things like Nyquist pulse shapes. Right? So there are several types. So before we conclude this lecture, uh, there are a few performance measures. So there, first of all, is something called peak interference, peak distortion. And what that just means is you just gather all the ISI contributions, pre and post cursor, and you say, how much ISI is in the channel when you combine them all together, right? 
and then the second guy. So, so what does that mean? So you basically add, but, it's, but, but the thing is that doesn't give you the peak. So what's the worst case scenario? So look at this guy here. So let's say that's an H0, that's H, let me double check because I don't want to screw up. So this is H1, H2, H3, that's H minus 1, H minus 2, H minus 3. What is the worst case scenario that you can have here? I0 is a 1, I minus 1 is a minus 1, so I make this negative. This guy is a negative, so I want to multiply by a plus value. I want this guy to, is, a, is a plus value, my, multiply by a negative value. So basically, whatever the main guy is, I want all the other ISI to be the exact opposite. I want to bring that guy as close to the decision threshold as possible. So look, look, if you look at it more closely, So let's assume that the symbol here is a positive value. What would you do in order to make it as negative as possible? You would make this guy, multiply this guy by a negative value, this guy by a negative value, this guy by a negative value, and that guy by a negative value, and multiply these two guys here with positive values. So in the end, all your ISI contributions are as negative as possible, and they would totally make the worst case scenario for this positive term. All right? And so that's what peak distortion is all about. It's really like, you know, what is the worst, the doomsday scenario for ISI? Ah! Okay. The other one is a little bit more on the average side, which is what is the mean squared distortion? What's the average distortion that you can, you're dealing with? And again, we, br we bring up our friend, the expected value. And what we'll find, okay, and we'll see this in the next lecture, is remember, you know, the probability of error. We can express it if we have an AWGN channel. Determine a factor that nudges our signal closer or further away from some sort of decision threshold to decide whether it's plus one or minus one, right? And we have noise present. What we'll find out in the next lecture is um, that we can express it as a Q function of, let's say, H naught. And it's nudged by all those distortion terms, divided by the variance, the, sorry, the square root of the variance of your noise. Okay? So this, okay, um, sort of gives you an introduction to the concept of, of, um, of what? Of ISI. Okay? So that, that concludes uh, this lecture. Okay. Yeah, that's a real core dump of, of ideas. So, so just just to uh, just.